Welcome to the Jongets Games tutorial for Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. In this video, I'll be teaching you the rules to the game as it's being played, and I will be showing two out of the game's six rounds today. Now, before I go into that, I do want to ask that if you enjoyed this video, that you please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. In addition to that, if you'd like to directly support the channel and gain access to a ton of exclusive perks, then please go to patreon.com slash Games. Some of those perks include my dozens of opinions episodes where I've talked about the hundreds of games that I've been playing over the last couple of years. You can also get access to some of my videos early and advertisement free and get access to an exclusive podcast feed where you can hear audio versions of all of my vlogs, including those opinions episodes I just talked about. Now, coming back to this game, I do want to ask that if while you're watching this, some part of it jumps out to you as particularly interesting, then please comment about that down below because I'd love to see that kind of feedback. All right, let's jump into the game. Out here, we have the game fully set up and ready to play for our three different players. Now, before I move on, I do want to ask that you please turn on the Klingon subtitles because I might make mistakes as I'm showing you the game, and those will let me put corrections on the screen where you should be able to see them, and I will also put corrections below this video in the top comment. I also want to mention that today I am filming with a prototype version of the game. That means the art, components, as well as rules might be different in the game's final version. Well, let's start things off with a brief overview of the game. In it, each player represents a house that is vying for control across the realm of Westeros. Since this is a three-player game, there are three player houses. However, every time you play the game, there will also be four non-player houses, and they have their own power tokens out here, and players can make alliances with these houses so that they can use that house's power to control Westeros. Now, the game takes place over six rounds, and at the start of each round, all five of these dice are rolled. Then, going in counterclockwise order, players are going to draft one of these dice and put it in front of them. Once there are just two dice remaining, those dice go to the current active player, and then we are going to take turns going clockwise around the table, choosing and placing one of these dice to get a bonus action, and then everyone will perform the action shown on the die. After that, the non-chosen die will move clockwise to the next player. Since they have two dice now, they are the active player. They choose one of these to place. Once again, we all get to do that action. And finally, once everyone has chosen a die to activate actions, we will then check alliances. If a player has at least two of these power tokens for a non-player house, and they have more than anyone else, then they gain that house's shield. And all of these tokens are effectively that player's tokens out here on the map. They can move them and recruit them, including that house's hero. Each house has one hero represented by a figure. They are stronger than the average troops out here on the map, and each hero is associated with a powerful card that can be used just like the other cards in our hands. Alliances can be fleeting, though. If another player gets more of those power tokens than you, then they will take that alliance, and suddenly all of the spaces on the map where you share spots with that previous alliance are now in conflict, and you must retreat out of all of them. Speaking of conflict, one of the things you can do is move your units around the map, and if you ever enter a region with opposing figures, then a battle immediately happens between the two of you. Now, this battle is pretty straightforward to perform. The attacking player can choose one card from their hand and put it face down. The defending player can also choose one card from their hand and put that face down. Then we flip these over, and the effect in the top left corner will activate. Sometimes that is attack power, and other times it is going to be specific battle effects that evaluate then. After you reveal those, you count up each player's power, and the player with the most power wins the battle, and the other player has to retreat out of it. Winning a battle is great because not only do you get a victory point, but also one of your opponent's figures are removed, and that could be a power token of a non-player house, which you then put over here to help you vie for taking over that alliance from your opponent. Now let's come back to the round track, because as you can see, after the 3, 5, and 6 space on it, there is going to be a scoring. Each of these scorings works the same way. Players are going to count the number of castles they control out here on the map. Now in this game, you control a castle if it isn't in the region, and you can see that icon right there. For example, the Lannisters control this castle because it's not there. You take these castles and you place them onto your gold track to show that you have them. Once again, players with the most castles will get the most victory points. Then, players can get extra points if they meet specific criteria underneath emptied slots of their power tokens. It has to be fully revealed, for example, this player could score both of these, but not that one. Again, they have to have empty spots above and meet the condition of that effect. After a scoring, we move on to the next round, and once we have completed six rounds as well as three scorings, the game will be over and the player with the most victory points will be the winner. Now, in that overview, I didn't describe most of the actions in the game, and there are several things I haven't quite gotten to yet, and don't worry, I'll explain how every element of this game works while we are playing it. 
On that note, I think it's now time to start the game. We are going to be House Stark, and we are also the starting player, which means we get this Hand of the King token. Our opponents will be House Lannister and House Baratheon, and let's now begin the first out of six rounds. The first thing we do in a round is have the Hand of the King player roll all five of the action dice. After that, the player to the right of the Hand of the King player will choose a die. They'll put their chosen die in front of them. However, before we see that, if it's a two or three player game, the first thing that player needs to do is choose one of these dice and place it on the action board. As you can see, there are three and two player icons down here. Now that die gets placed onto the associated spot and all players will get to do this action as the last action they will perform in the round. If this was a four player game, obviously that wouldn't happen. And if it was a two player game, then both of the players would put one die over there to be activated at the end of the round. So Baratheon has chosen the die that everyone will activate later, and now they choose one die for themselves. They're going to go with this die here, and as you can tell, when you take these dice, you do not change their side. After that, going in counterclockwise order, the next player chooses one of these dice. This is House Lannister, and they want to take that die, which leaves two dice remaining for us. Now we take both of these dice, we put them in front of us, and since all dice have now been taken, the draft is over, and we can now move into the action phase of the round. The way this works is whichever player has two dice in front of them becomes the active player, and they must choose one of these two dice to then place onto the action board in order for actions to happen. Obviously, we are House Stark, so this is our decision to make now. And I do want to mention that as we are making this dice decision, we can use all of the dice manipulation abilities available to us. As House Stark, this is ours. It says we can set one die to its recruiting face. If we have an alliance with a non-player house, then we also have access to that house's dice manipulation ability. For example, House Martell lets you reroll both of the dice one time. And if we had the situation, we could roll both of them and then still decide we're going to use this effect to set one die to the recruiting face. Obviously, we do not have this alliance just yet. In fact, no one will have any alliances until at least the end of the first round, and I'll explain how those work in more detail later. For now, the only thing we can do is set a die to its recruiting face. And with that in mind, let's come over here and see what our options are. This die shows the plotting action on it, and that die shows the march action. Now the face-up action on the die we choose will be an action that every player can do in this round in clockwise order starting with us. So do we want everyone to march, or do we want everyone to plot, or again we could change either of these to the recruit phase, which means everyone could then recruit. You know what? I think we're going to use our House Stark ability. We're going to turn this march into a recruit and choose this die. This means everyone will be able to do a recruit action, but before that happens, we have to place this die onto an empty bonus action slot. The action that slot is associated with is a bonus action that we get to do and none of our opponents can. With that in mind, I'm going to put it here so that we are going to perform a march action immediately, and then after we march, everyone can recruit. By going here, we have also blocked the one march bonus action for the rest of the round, so none of the opponents can gain an extra march like this. So let's perform a march action. When we focus in, that means we can move our units from one domain up to two domains by land away, and we may pick up and drop off units along the way. Now at the start of the game, each of us placed our house hero onto our home domain, as well as one power token, and that means we only have units in Winterfell currently. So that means if we want to march, we must select Winterfell, since this is the only place where we have units. Now again, we can take as many units as we want from one domain and move them one or two adjacent domains away by land. Each time you march, you must cross a solid white line, and you are not allowed to march across diagonals. For example, Winterfell is not adjacent to Last Hearth, but if we wanted to get there, we can move to Hornwood first and then go up to Last Hearth. Now I mentioned that we can pick up and drop off units along the way, so if we wanted to, we could move here for our first move, and then drop that power off, and then move our hero over to Last Hearth. Likewise, if we had a situation like this, then we could move into Hornwood, pick up this power token, and then move all three of those over to Last Hearth. Now at the end of the move, we must always obey the domain unit limit. Simply put, there can never be more than three units of one house within a domain, and that does include a hero. So right here, we would be at our domain limit for House Stark, but if we had an alliance with House Martell, they could also be in this domain with us. 
again, with up to three of them. And if we happen to also have an alliance with House Greyjoy, we could not be in a region with them. There can be at most two different houses units in one domain, and each of those houses cannot have more than three units. Again, if there are two houses, they must be allied, otherwise a battle would immediately happen. Obviously, we don't have any alliances just yet, and we can reset to the situation we were in. And with this march, I think we are going to move just this power token, and we'll head up to the Shadow Tower, and then go one more space over to Castle Black. That has finished our march, and we are obviously not over the domain unit limit, but before we move on, we can see that we have a power token within an unoccupied castle domain. This means we take over the castle, removing it from the board. If there were other units here, we would have had to successfully battle them, forcing them to retreat before we could gain this castle. Of course, this was just empty, so we can take this castle from the castle black domain, and this is actually our second castle. In our home domain, there was also a castle, and during setup, we removed it from the board because we do control that domain, and we put it on the 9 spot on our coin track. Every time we gain a new castle, we have to put it onto the next highest mark. So we're going to put this castle there, and we can easily see that we control two castles, and by putting these down, we are limiting the maximum number of coins that we can hold. Thematically, this lowering of our maximum gold represents the amount of money we have to spend on upkeep for these castles. Controlling castles can be good for a couple of reasons. One of those is that if you control that region, then you get plus one defense if somebody attacks you there. Now, defense only comes into play with battles, and I'll explain how that works later on. For now, we have completed our march action. And because we performed that as our bonus action, no one else gets to do it. Now, we get to do a recruit action, and after we finish this, every one of our opponents will also have this opportunity going clockwise around the table. With this in mind, let's focus over here on the recruit action. That says we can pay money to place up to two units from either our force track or an ally mat into a domain that we control. Now, once again, we don't have any alliances yet, but if we did have an alliance, then one or both of the units that we recruit could be from that alliance. Each time we recruit from an alliance mat, it costs one gold, and we can see that cost printed right over there. Once again, we are not allied with House Martell. They've been a good example for us, though. We can also see that cost printed right over here, but of course, we don't have any alliances just yet, so now we are going to recruit just from our own force track. When we recruit, we take the leftmost power token, and we put it out onto the board as a unit. The cost for this is indicated above that token. I do want to recruit both of these, and they are both under the one gold cost, so each of these that we recruit is going to cost us one gold. At the start of the game, everyone began with three gold, so we can now spend two of it, bringing us down to one. Now again, when you recruit, you can only take up to two tokens, but I do want to point out that the next one to recruit is going to cost two gold, then three gold each, and finally four gold each to place your last two power tokens onto the map. Now I do want to point out that when you lose battles, you do lose one of your units, and when they come back to your map, they can then be recruited in the future, and you also get the bonus that they cover up when they come back to the map. But I'll explain how that works in more detail later. For now, we can place both of these units out, and each of them must go into a domain that we control. We control two domains, and this is part of the reason I wanted to do this after we marched, because at the start of the game, we just controlled one, and we would not have been able to recruit two of these units, because that would have put us up to four in that domain, which is over the limit. So, by doing a march action first, we are able to fully utilize this recruit action. For now, I think we're going to recruit both of these into Winterfell. We're going to leave Castle Black with that one unit up there. Well, we are done recruiting, which means we can now go clockwise to the next player, that is House Lannister, and they may recruit. They're going to spend one of their gold to recruit once, because as I just described, they have not marched just yet, so that will bring them to their domain unit limit at Casterly Rock. They definitely would have liked to recruit again, but that's not an option for them right now. And likewise, after House Lannister, House Baratheon can recruit, and they will spend one coin to recruit once as well. They can place this into Storm's End, bringing them to that domain unit limit. And with that done, everyone has now had the chance to perform a recruit action. Now, this is optional. If either of these houses decided not to do it, they would simply not perform the action. There is no benefit for deciding not to do the action that was dictated by the chosen die. Once everyone has chosen an action, the die that was not chosen will be passed to the next player clockwise, so that is going to be House Lannister, and now they are the active player, and just like us, they have to choose from one of these two dice, and when we focus in on their house mat, we can see their ability lets them set a die to its event face. Their action options are Recruit and Plot. Again, they could turn either of these into an event face, though. 
They've decided not to do that, though, and they are going to choose the plot die. That means everyone will plot. However, they get to do a bonus action just for themselves, and they can choose any option but march because, of course, that is blocked. Now, they're going to go here on the whisper action. So now they alone can perform the first whisper action of the game. This says they may discard any number of cards from their hand to gain one gold for each card they discard, and then they draw back up to their maximum of four cards. Now, at the start of the game, everyone got five cards. You can see our cards over here. One of them is our hero. We always start with that in our hand, and the other four were randomly drawn from this large plot deck. Now, I did mention that the hand limit is four, and that is four plot cards. You can have as many hero cards in your hand as you want. Now, once again, in a whisper action, you can discard plot cards. You cannot discard heroes from your hand, and it looks like House Lannister wants to discard all three of these plot cards. So those go into a communal discard pile, and then they gain one gold for each, so that will jump them up to five gold. After that, they draw back to their plot limit of four. They have one, so that means they draw three cards from the top of the plot deck. Well, speaking of plotting, it's now time for them to perform the first plot action of the game. Of course, once they are done, everyone else can perform this in clockwise order from the active player. Now let's focus down here, and as you can see, it says you can play a card from your hand for its shields, and then pay gold to gain power tokens in your ally pool. So the Lannisters can look at their hand, and they are going to play this card for its plot effect. As you can see, there are shields in the top right corner, and when you are doing a plot action, this is the only thing that you look at on these cards. Each of these cards serve multiple purposes, with the plot action icons in the top right, the battle action icons in the top left, and the event description in the bottom. Once again, because they are playing this Inspire Your Army card, for the shields, they will not actually perform anything on the bottom or the left side of the card. Now, for each of the shield that shows up on the card they chose, they can plot to take one power token from that house. Let's focus up, and as you can see, the card they chose shows the house Tyrrell shield, and it has the house Greyjoy shield. That means they can try to plot with each of these separately, and they're going to start with the Greyjoys. Now, whenever you plot with a non-player house, you simply pay one gold in order to take a power token from that house's mat, and you then place it into your ally pool. If in this moment there hadn't been any of these tokens in that pool, then instead for that plot action, they could spend a coin to take one House Greyjoy power token from any other player and put it back here onto that house mat. Once again, that action didn't let them steal this token from another player, but it did let them remove it from that player, and once here they could do another plot action with House Greyjoy in order to spend a gold and take this power token. Of course, that was not the case here and now they can plot with House Tyrrell. This is also a non-player house, so they're going to spend one gold to take one of these power tokens and put that into their ally pool. That has finished House Lannister's plot action, but before we move on, I'd like to talk about two other possibilities. If one of the shields they want to activate is associated with themselves, then they could spend two gold in order to take a power token from any non-player house. Lastly, if the shield chosen matches up with a player house, then you could spend three gold to take any power token from that player's ally pool and put it into your own. This is obviously very expensive, but it is also a very impactful change between the players because these tokens in our ally pools are how we form alliances with the non-player houses at the end of each round. I'll go into this in more detail later, but at a high level, you must have at least two power tokens in that house, and you must have more power tokens than any other player, and if both of those things are true, then you take the crest for that house, they are your alliance, and all of their units on the map are effectively your units, for as long, of course, as this alliance is intact. Now again, I'll talk about this in more detail later, we can see for now that House Lannister has two of these tokens, but they are for two different houses, so they are not lined up yet to be able to form an alliance with either of these houses at the end of the round even though I'm sure they're hoping to make that happen. Well, House Lannister is done plotting, so now Baratheon can choose to plot if they want. They've decided to go with this card here. As you can see, that shows the House Tully and House Tyrell shields on the top. In this game, there is no House Tully, though, so that shield effectively doesn't exist, and this lets them plot with House Tyrell. They are going to do that, so they spend one gold, which lets them take a power token from House Tyrell. So it looks like they have the same amount as House Lannister, at least for the moment. That has finished their plot action, so now we get to do one. And we, of course, don't have to, but it is good to if we have the option. Unfortunately, we only have one money, so we can only plot once, even if we play a card with two shields. 
Now, it's nice having our own shield because that gives us flexibility. If we obviously play this, we could spend two gold to take a power for any non-player house. The problem is we don't currently have two gold. We also have this House Tully card, but again, House Tully isn't in the game. So I think it probably makes sense for us to use this card here. That shows House Baratheon and House Greyjoy. Now again, because this shows the crest of an opposing player house, that means we could spend three of our gold to take one power token from their ally pool and put it into ours. That would of course be great, but we do not have the gold to make that happen. So instead, we're going to ignore the Baratheon crest and instead just go for Greyjoy. This costs us our last gold, and we take this and put it into our ally pool. It isn't great competing directly with opponents, and it looks like there's a lot of overlap so far, but that just appears to be the options that we had. Of course, we could have just not done anything, but I like the idea of getting these tokens, because having alliances gives us a lot more power and options out there in Westeros. Well, everyone has had the option of doing a plot action, which means the remaining die goes to House Baratheon, and they can choose one of them. I do want to point out their ability says they can set a die to its plot face. But with one gold and seeing House Lannister has three, they don't want to also give them the option to do another plot action. So instead, what they've decided to do is pick the event die and place it onto the plot action spot. So that means just House Baratheon can do another plot action. They currently have four cards, and they want to play this one. As you can see, it has one shield, and that is for House Tyrrell. This is a non-player house, so they can spend their last gold to take this power token. And as you can see, they now have two Tyrrell power tokens in their ally pool. That means they are well on their way to an alliance with House Tyrrell. But again, alliances are not checked until after all actions have been performed in the round, unless you find a card with an event that lets you do it early. Now, speaking of events, we can see that bonus plot action is done. So it's now time for everyone to perform an event in player order. When we look back at the action card, it says for the event action, we can play a card from our hand to perform its listed text at the bottom, and then we discard the card. House Baratheon begins this because they are the active player, and they are going to play Drain the Coffers. At the bottom, we can see that event icon, and just this is going to activate, and it's pretty great for them. It says they gain six gold, but only if they have zero gold. Fortunately for them, they currently have zero gold. It's almost like they planned it that way. So they gain six gold, bringing them all the way up here. They have just two cards left in their hand, and now we can perform an event from one of the cards that we have in our hand. Well, let's take a look at our four cards. The first one is Eddard Stark. This is actually our hero card. At the start of the round, we place this into our hand as long as our hero is out there on the map. And this says when we play it as an event, we gain two gold immediately, and then we may perform a recruit action. If we got two gold, that would bring us to two, and we could use that to recruit one more unit onto the board. I like the idea of this. However, where I'd want to put this is Winterfell, and that domain is already at the unit limit. So I'm not sure if this makes sense right now. Next up, we have Lone Wolf. That says we gain one victory point and three gold if we have no alliances. Well, we don't have any alliances just yet. Those would be shield tokens in our area. So now might be a good time to play this, especially if we think we are going to be getting an alliance soon. After that, we have Enlist the Faceless Men. That says we could pay two gold to eliminate any one unit from any domain, but this cannot be a hero. That is a very powerful effect, but of course we don't have the gold for it. So this does not make sense for us right now. And lastly, there is Press into Battle. This would let us do a march or sail action so that we start combat with a non-player house, and if we are successful, we get an extra bonus from that. I haven't actually talked about battle just yet, and I don't think we're going to do this now, so I'll explain more about this card in the future. I do hope to play this sooner rather than later. For now, I think, let's just go with Lone Wolf. I do want to point out that if we went with Eddard Stark, we would play it off to the side, not onto the main discard pile, and if at the end of the round, this figure was still on the map, we would pull this card back into our hand. So this is one we can keep using, but again, I think I'm gonna go with the Lone Wolf. So that will get us three gold because we don't have any alliances, and it will get us our first victory point of the game. The victory point track is over here, so we have one point. Having the most points is how you win, so that feels good. Well, we are done with our event, so moving clockwise, House Lannister can now perform an event from their hand. After looking at their options, they are going to play Littlefinger's Influence. It says they can return one power token from their ally pool to its owner's token pool, and then take two power tokens from another house token pool into their ally pool. This lets them remove one of these, and both of these have been contested by an opponent. They could double down or diversify, 
and I think they've decided to return this Greyjoy power token, and then they're going to go with House Aaron. Now, this is always a non-player house. There is no hero associated with it, and obviously no hero card. They can place both of these into their ally pool, and they are done with their event. Since we've all had a chance to perform that event, we are done with that overall action. And since every player has been the active player, that is going to bring us near the end of the action phase. We're not quite done, though, because this is a two or three player game. And that means there is at least one die over here. If you remember from the draft, House Baratheon began by selecting this die and placing it over here. Now, everyone can perform this action, which is a sale action. And this will go in clockwise order, starting with us and ending with House Baratheon. So let's take a look at the sale action. That says we can move our units from one domain to a domain up to two map cards away by sea. We currently have units in two domains, and I think we are going to select Winterfell. Now what we're going to do is move by sea, and the way this works is we move one or two map cards away from our current map card. Once we arrive at the card we want, we move into any of the domains that are there. You'll notice every domain in Westeros has some portion of coast. So we're starting up here, and that means we can access this map card or that map card. It's important to note, you cannot sail to another domain within the same map card. So we're looking at the west, specifically at this card or that card. Of course, if we were sailing from here, we could travel to four different card options, but it's hard to get around when you're starting up here at the north. It's worth noting the sea wraps around the bottom, but not up at the top. You cannot sail around there. It is much too cold. Now again, we don't have to do this action, but I do think we want to. We are going to start sailing from Winterfell, and we can take as many units as we want, but I want to leave one behind so that we still control that domain. We are going to sail from Winterfell. We could go to either of these, and specifically, I think we want to head to this map card and land at Pike. If it wasn't obvious, you must end a sailing action in a domain. You are never allowed to stay in the sea. Now, the reason we're moving over here is because as soon as we arrive, there is a battle. That's because there are two different house units within the same domain, and they are not allied yet. We have one Greyjoy power token in our ally pool, and we need a second one of these in order to form an alliance with them later on this round. One way to get power tokens is by beating them in a battle, so let's focus in. Now, a battle is won by having more strength than the opposing side in that battle. At the start, we can count up our current strength based off of the figures in this domain. Each power token is worth one strength, so the Greyjoys currently have three. We have one power token, so that's one, and each hero in a domain is worth Two strength. You can see these are printed here on our player board. So our current strength is two plus one or three, but the Greyjoys have a castle. Now this castle is on the board. Remember these castles are removed once a player house controls that region. The Greyjoys aren't a player house, but this castle still exists and it still gives them that plus one defense for the domain. That means the Greyjoys have four strength total to our three, and in order to win, we need more strength than the Greyjoys. If there is a tie in strength, the tie is broken by the defender, and we are the aggressor. Of course, we could have come in with another power token, but if we did that, we'd be giving up Winterfell, and we'd have to place that castle back on the map. So currently, we are losing this battle. However, strength doesn't just come from the figures in the domain. It also comes from cards. As I mentioned before, these are multi-use cards, and the icons in the top left relate to battle. Now let's talk about the structure of a battle. As soon as there are figures from two non-allied houses in a domain, the battle happens, and the aggressor may play one card from their hand. They put that card face down, and I do want to point out that there is sometimes gold costs associated with the battle icon. Now as the aggressor, we don't have to pay this, so we will, I think, use Eddard Stark. We're going to play that card into this battle, and we can only play one. After we optionally put one face down, the defending player may play up to one card from their hand face down. Now, if this is a player-controlled house, they have to play a card from their hand, and if the card they play has a gold cost, they have to pay that. So this is essentially the defense cost for playing that card into a battle. Now, in this case, we are going against a non-player house. That means we simply add the top card from the deck into the battle for them, and of course, they don't have to pay a potential gold cost on that card because they don't have any gold. This is why what we're doing is a risk, but I think it's a risk worth doing. So the Greyjoys draw the top card from the deck, and if you remember, currently we have three strength and the Greyjoys have four, and we can now reveal the cards and see how this changes things. We added three strength with our card, so we actually have six, and the Greyjoys played a card that does not have specifically a strength number in the top left corner. Instead, 
This is a conscripts action. Now this activates right away. And the way this works is for the Greyjoys, they gain strength for all friendly units in adjacent regions. So this can be worth a ton of strength if it's played at the right moment when positioned next to regions with your units. Fortunately for us, the Greyjoys don't have any adjacent regions with friendly units, so this is functionally a zero. That was definitely a good pull for us. So the Greyjoys have four strength, we have six, and because we have more than them, we win the battle. The cards that were played into the battle go into the discard pile, unless it is a hero card, in which case you just leave it face up in front of you. At this point, let's focus over on the round card, because it has a section describing what happens at the end of battle. As you can see, the first thing is that the winner gains one victory point, and again, as I said, defender, and again, as I said, the defender wins ties. There was not a tie, thankfully, so we are the winner, so we do win that battle and gain one victory point. This brings us up to two. After that, it says the losing player must remove one unit and then retreat to the nearest available friendly domain or unoccupied fief domain. So, one losing figure has to be removed, and when this happens for a non-player house, then the winning player takes that figure and places it directly into their ally pool. These tokens in here are essentially the power that we have over those other houses. We could gain it by plotting, and we could gain it by beating them in battle. Speaking of removing units, before we move on, I do want to point out that you are never allowed to attack a domain if it has the last remaining unit of a house on the map. Essentially, the last unit for each house cannot be attacked, and it also cannot attack unless it attacks along with allied units that are also not the single last unit of that house. After removing a unit, the losing house must retreat all of their units to the nearest friendly domain or unoccupied fief domain. Now, a fief domain are the domains on the board that show a coin instead of having a castle. The Greyjoys currently don't have any friendly domains, and they are adjacent to Riverrun, which is a castle domain, and Ashmark, which is a fief. That means they must retreat over here. If there was a choice of multiple closest retreat options, then we would get to decide where they go. Now, I do want to point out that they will always retreat to the closest one, even if there are opposing houses in all adjacent domains. To illustrate this with an example, let's pretend like the Lannisters actually had a unit over here in Ashmark and they controlled it. In this case, when Greyjoy tries to retreat, Ashmark is still the closest fief to them, but they are not allowed to retreat there. So then they look to the next closest friendly or unoccupied fief domain. So, in this example, they now check to see if a domain two steps away will match with these conditions. That is the case. We can see River Run is one step away, and Flint's Finger is adjacent to River Run, and that is a fief domain. Three Sisters is also a fief domain two steps away from the Pike. When we look down here, though, there are no eligible spots. Because adjacent to Ashmark, there are just castle domains. These Shield Islands are one, two, three steps away. So, in this example, the Greyjoys would retreat either to Flint's Finger or to Three Sisters. If there were opposing units in River Run, that wouldn't change this at all. They essentially sneak through and never start a battle when retreating. Of course, neither of these things are true. And as I said, the Greyjoys retreat into Ashmark. As soon as that retreat happens, we now can take this castle, because there are no opposing houses in the same region as our figures. Of course, at the end of the battle, this will always be the case because the loser must retreat away. So we get to take our third castle of the game and put that onto our money track. These castles are expensive, though. We cannot store more than six gold at a time. It's worth noting, if we had seven gold right now and we got this castle, we would actually lose that gold to place the castle down. That's, of course, not the case, though. At this point, we are done with our sale action. But before we move on, I'd like to talk a little bit about King's Landing. When we focus in, you can see instead of a castle, there is an Iron Throne token, and next to the name King's Landing, it shows three castle icons. What this means is you are not allowed to enter King's Landing unless you control at least three castles. I mentioned earlier that there are multiple reasons why you want castles, and this is certainly one of those. When you control King's Landing at the end of the round, you will get two gold coins instead of one from the fiefs. I haven't talked about that just yet, but don't worry, we're getting there soon. And if you control King's Landing, you also control the Iron Throne. This is worth two extra defense in that domain, and this is a wild ally token. While you have it, it counts as one ally in every single non-player house. As you can see, there is a lot of power that comes from controlling King's Landing, but if you control King's Landing and somewhere else on the map, you lose a castle which brings you under controlling three, 
then you immediately have to retreat out of King's Landing because you no longer meet that criteria. Since we have three castles, that means we could potentially enter King's Landing, but we are not in a position to move any more this round, and we might not have three castles once we are in that position. So, we have finished our sail action, and now the Lannisters have the option of sailing. Unfortunately for us, it looks like the Lannisters want to capitalize on the fact that we left Winterfell less defended than it was before, and they are going to sail these two power tokens over and invade Winterfell. Of course, they could have brought their hero, Jaime Lannister, along, but if they left Casterly Rock, then they would no longer control it. They decided to leave Jaime behind, though. And now a battle starts between us and the Lannisters. The Lannisters have two strength. We have one from our figure and one from our castle. So currently it is a tie, and ties go to the defender, so that's a good thing for us. Now the aggressing Lannisters can play one card from their hand, and they've decided to do so, and now we optionally can spend a card from our hand. We have these two cards here. Now, if we used this one, we are defending, so we'd have to spend one coin, and that would bring our strength from two up to five. This would be good as long as they put a one, two, or three down here, but if they put a four or higher, we would still be losing, and we would have lost out on that gold. Another option for us is this. That is a retreat flag. This is another one of the battle actions. It does not cost gold, and once we reveal this, we simply leave. We don't actually lose a figure. I'd really like to keep Winterfell, so I think we are going to try and defend. We're not going to use the retreat. We are instead going to use press into battle. Of course, we don't look at the bottom. We just look at the top. We spend one gold in order to add three strength. We then flip these over, and ooh, <laughs> we lost this one. The Lannisters played Kingslayer. Now, again, the bottom text does not matter. That's what happens when you play this for the event. Up here, this added five strength. Now, if you were to use this in defense, you'd have to spend three gold coins. But remember, as the aggressor, you don't pay for this. So that means their two strength in figures is bolstered by five and ours by three. So we have five strength and they have seven. That is definitely not a tie. And this means, unfortunately, we have lost the battle. Now, the Lannisters won, so they get one point for winning the battle. Then, of course, one figure of the losing side must be removed. And after that, if there are any more figures, those have to retreat. But it looks like this is the only one there, so there is no more retreating that happens. The removed unit is now placed back onto our force track, and we put it onto the rightmost empty slot, and if there is an icon on it, we get that immediately. So, this is a bit of a consolation prize. We lost this unit, and they go there, but they give us one gold immediately back, which is essentially the gold that we paid to recruit them onto the map. If we brought a unit back here, we could draw a single plot card from the top of the deck. It's worth noting, if your hero is removed, you'd place it here, and you get two gold coins and a victory point for having your hero be removed. And of course, once they are here, you can recruit them back onto the map, but it does cost three gold to do so. Let's come back to Winterfell, and again, there were no units to retreat, but now there is a castle that will change hands. This means the Lannisters simply take our leftmost castle and put it onto their track. Well, that didn't go great for us. <laughs> These cards are discarded. They did have to use a very powerful card to make that happen, but I think they're feeling pretty good about it. The Lannisters are done sailing, so now the Baratheons can if they want. And from here, they could sail to this card and attack the Lannisters at Casterly Rock, or us, I guess, at Pike. There are a lot of options on these spaces. Also, they could go all the way up here and potentially try to kick us out of Castle Black. They've decided they're going to keep things simple, though and sail these two figures over one card, and then land them at Starfall. They, of course, take this castle, which is their second castle, and that has finished everyone's sail action, and that also means the action phase of this first round is over. This means we can now all check to see if we gain alliances. As I've mentioned a couple of times, in order to make an alliance with a non-player house, you have to have at least two ally tokens of that house, and you have to have strictly more of these tokens than any other player house. It looks like we have two Greyjoy, no one else has two Greyjoy, so we will start an alliance with House Greyjoy. We show that by taking the shield, and we put it right over here, and the moment we do that, every House Greyjoy figure is now under our control and is effectively ours for as long as this alliance lasts. Now we can see that the Greyjoys have Euron Greyjoy as their hero, and we can recruit Euron Greyjoy for two gold. If we do that, we also take the card associated with it. With that hero, we put it into our hand, and remember, these don't count against our hand limit of four plot cards. 
In addition to that, we also have access to this alliance ability that lets us set a die to its sailing face. So it's going to be a lot easier for us to make sailing actions happen. That's all the alliances for us. We can now see that the Lannisters have one token for Tyrrell, and that's not enough. But they do have two for House Aaron, and that is. That means they form an alliance with House Aaron. They can take this shield, and now they have access to this powerful alliance ability. They can pay one gold to change a die to any face. Once again, House Aaron can never be controlled by players, and it does not have a hero. Now, as I said before, the moment you start an alliance, those figures on the board effectively become yours, and that means that the Lannisters now control all of these House Aaron figures in the Eyrie, which means they also control this castle. So they'll put that onto their gold track. And now House Baratheon is going to start an alliance with the Tyrrells. Their alliance ability lets them set a die to the Whisper action phase, and their hero is Olena Tyrrell. Much like House Aaron, the Tyrrells start with a castle, and since these are now Baratheon units functionally, House Baratheon will take this castle. This, of course, did not happen for us because we already took over that castle by force. Of course, by attacking our future ally, we did get the ally token we needed to form that alliance, but we also weakened them. We removed one of those tokens off the board and pushed them into a different region. It's very possible this was a bad idea, but it was the main way I could see for us to get an alliance at the end of this first round, and we'll just have to see how it goes. Baratheon's third castle goes here, and they just barely don't have to spend a gold coin to take it. Well, that's it for our alliances, and I do want to mention that in the future, when we check for alliances, in order for an alliance to move to somebody else, they have to have more than the previous player. So, for example, if House Lannister wants to take over the Tyrrell alliance, they would need to have at least one more of these tokens than House Baratheon does. The last thing to mention about alliances is, once again, if you lose an alliance, then suddenly all of those figures that were your ally are your enemy. If you have some of your house figures in the same domain as one of your previous allies, then you immediately have to retreat away from them. Now that we have all checked our alliances, we have to cull the ally pools. The way this works is every player has to remove ally tokens down to a maximum of two per non-player house, and all of those removed tokens are placed back onto the house mats. So for example, if House Baratheon had three of these Tyrrell tokens, they would have to remove one of them going down to two, and this makes it much more possible for opponents to take over alliances even if you take a bunch of allies within one round. Well, our alliances are done, and now it's time for us to tax the fiefdoms. As I briefly mentioned before, fief domains have a single coin on them, whereas the castle domains don't, except for King's Landing that has two coins. But we've already talked about how that one is more difficult to control. In this moment, everyone simply gains the coins in the fief domains they control. We control Ashmark because, of course, we forced House Greyjoy to retreat over there when we kicked them out of Pike. Since they are now our ally, we can tax Ashmark and get one gold. And in fact, that's the only fief domain that is currently occupied, so none of our opponents get any extra gold. They've been prioritizing the castles, and castles are important for scoring. After taxing fiefdoms, players will gain all of the benefits that are currently uncovered on their force track. We, of course, covered this one up recently when that force came back. If we hadn't, we would have gained a coin anyway. So getting the benefit for returning that token essentially means your income for your force track is not reduced in the same round where you lost that figure. So we gain one gold, and we draw one random block card from the top of the deck. In this case, we found the King's Roads. Now, as an event, it says we can perform up to two separate marches and gain three gold if neither of these results in a battle, so we can really move and get gold. And in the top left corner for the battle, this is the last of the battle actions. Now, this one is a secret action. Whenever a card with the secret action is revealed in battle, you simply draw the next card from the top of the deck, and that is going to be the card that you use for the battle. So this could be very good, and of course, also very non-effective, depending on the situation. Of course, our opponents also gain benefits from the Force Tracks, and it's the same for all of us, it looks like. Lannister will draw a plot card and get one gold, and House Baratheon will also draw a card and try to gain a gold, but these three castles means they can't go above six, and they already have six gold, so that gold they would have gained is lost. The final thing we do in the taxing step is return any hero cards to our hand as long as that hero is still out on the map. Next up, we potentially perform a scoring. Now, scoring only happens after the third, fifth, and sixth rounds of the game. It's not going to happen right now, but let's talk about it in a little more detail. The first thing we score is castle majorities. In a three-player game, the player with the most castles will get three victory points, the second most will get two, and the third most will get one, as long, of course, as they have at least one castle. 
If there is a tie for one of these steps, then all of the tied players get the full amount of victory points. And in fact, the next step is not skipped. So if in this game there was a tie for first, then both the tied players would get three points, and then the third player would get two points. After scoring castle majorities, we then score the house objectives. These are under our force track, and we can score each objective that has no figures directly above it. At the start of the game, we had two figures out, and that means this first one was available, and it's simple. It just says we get a point if we currently control our home domain. We of course got kicked out of our home domain of Winterfell, so before that first scoring that happens after the third round, we want to make sure that we take it back. Now each of these objectives is the same for every house, with the first one giving a point for controlling your house's domain. After that, this will give you one point if you control two fief domains, which again are the domains that give one coin. If you have all of these cleared, and you have three fief domains, then that will give you an extra point. If you have all of these cleared, and you control King's Landing, that will give you a point. And if you have every one of your figures on the map when you score, you also get a bonus point just for being fully deployed. After potentially scoring house objectives, each player will get one point for every alliance they have. So alliances are good not only for having figures on the board, but also for getting points during scoring. And finally, during the first and second scorings, the player with the lowest score will gain the Vengeance token. These right here are the Vengeance tokens, as you can see, after the third and fifth rounds. And once you take a Vengeance token, you will have it for the rest of the game. And the effect of this says every time you start a battle for the rest of the game, you get one extra victory point. If the same player happens to get the second Vengeance token, then every time they start a battle for the remainder of the game, they get two victory points. Well, at this point, we're done with the first round, so we can move into the second round by moving the round marker over once and passing the Hand of the King token clockwise. So that means House Lannister will be the Hand of the King in this upcoming round. And they, of course, start this by rolling all five of the dice. So let's see what they roll. And that is two sailing actions, a march, an event, as well as a recruit. We are to the right of the Hand of the King player, and since it's a three-player game, we have to put one of these tokens onto the action mat, and all of us will perform that action. We will perform that action last. We could put a sail action as the last one, just like before, but I think instead we'll put a march action down. So that goes here, and everyone will be able to march as their last action of the action phase. Now we can take one of these dice, and it will be one of the two dice options that we have when it's our turn to be the active player. Events can be really powerful. I think we're going to take the event die so that we can have some control over it. After that, Baratheon can take one of these, and they've decided to take the recruit. That means these two sail dice go over here, and House Lannister now becomes the active player, and they can choose one of these to then perform the action. Actually, before we do that, I need to correct a little mistake I made. I accidentally had the Baratheons move Martell. I got confused there. They did not move to Starfall to take that castle. They moved to the reach to take this castle. I'll just move that over there. That's essentially what I meant to do. Sorry about that. So the Lannisters have to put one of these down. They each show sail, but the Lannisters can set a die to the event face, and their allies House Aaron lets them spend a coin to set a die to any face of their choice. They actually like the idea of performing an event action, so they will set this one to the event. It's worth noting, you can set a die and then not use it, and then pass it on to somebody else. Now, they've decided they are going to do this, and they want to recruit first. So they get to do this recruit action, and no one else gets to. They have four gold, and that means they could recruit both of these, but of course, they also have an alliance with House Aaron, which means they can recruit those ally tokens onto the board for one gold each. Of course, recruiting these does not uncover any force bonuses, whereas this does, so I think they are going to spend three of their gold to recruit these two ally tokens. We can see that has cleared up this objective. If that continues to be clear when the scoring happens, they'll get one point if they control two fief domains at that time. Again, that's going to happen after the third round, and this is the start of the second round. They, of course, recruit these into domains they control. They currently have Casterly Rock, the Eyrie, because of their alliance with House Aaron, as well as Winterfell, <laughs> because they sailed up there and kicked us out. Now, they've decided they're going to put both of these onto Casterly Rock. That's finished their bonus recruit action, and now everyone, starting with them, can perform the event action. House Lannister starts, and they are going to play the Element of Surprise event. That says they can choose a domain except for King's Landing that is adjacent to a domain they control. They eliminate one power token there, and then any remaining units must retreat, because obviously that dragon is making them move. 
Unfortunately for us, that will hit our allies, the Greyjoys. They are indeed at Ashmark, which is adjacent to Casterly Rock, so they are going to eliminate this power token and force a retreat of this one, and they must retreat back over here because that is the closest friendly or unoccupied fief domain. Between us attacking our soon-to-be allies and Lannister's element of surprise, there are not that many of these Greyjoy forces out on the map. So far, we have the weakest alliance, and I think we are partly to blame for that. Lannisters are done with their event, and now Baratheon could go. They've decided to play a timely alliance. It says they can perform a plot action, and then, if they have at least two power tokens and the majority for any house, they can gain that alliance now in the middle of the action phase. Remember, normally you have to wait until the check alliance phase after all actions have happened. So, House Baratheon alone can perform a plot action, and they are going to use their hero card, Robert Baratheon. As you can see, just like all the other hero cards, it shows two shields with their crest on it. And when you plot with your own crest, you can spend two of your gold to take a power token from any non-player house. So they'll spend two gold going down to four, and then they'll take the first house martel token. That will go here, and for their other house crest, they'll spend two more gold. As you can see, having a lot of gold gives you a lot of options in order to once again take an ally token for House Martell, which is their second. And then, of course, from the Timely Alliance card, it says if they have at least two power tokens from a house, and they do, and they have a majority, which they do, they ally with it immediately. So they become allies with House Martell right now. This was a great event step for them. They are really happy House Lannister made this happen. Of course, the moment they ally with House Martell, they gain the castle from Sunspear. This is their fourth castle, and remember, when you score, the player with the most castles in a three-player game will get three points, and that's a lot, but the scoring isn't going to happen until the end of the next round, not this round. Now, having four castles is good for House Baratheon in particular, because as you can see, if they're able to play their Robert Baratheon card for the event, it says if they control four or more castles, then they place their gold coin on the maximum space of its track. Essentially, they want to have four castles and then play Robert Baratheon to gain up to five gold. Of course, they played this for the plot effect, so they most likely won't have access to this again in this round. It is technically possible that they might lose a battle with their hero. That would bring their hero back, and then they could recruit that hero back out onto the map, which would bring this card back into their hand, but I think that situation is unlikely. All right, Baratheon is done, and they are very happy with that action. And now we get to go. We've already seen our Eddard Stark and Enlist the Faceless Men card. The new one we got is the King's Road, which lets us do two marches, and if we don't start a battle, we get three gold. Unfortunately for us right now, we just don't have that many figures on the board, so marching does not make sense. I think let's play the Eddard Stark card for the event. That gets us two gold, and then we can perform our own recruit action. Two gold brings us to our current maximum of seven, and then we can recruit up to two units. If we recruited our own units, that would cost us three gold. And we are still allied with the much beleaguered Greyjoys. Each of these would cost one gold, but we could also recruit Euron Greyjoy for two gold. I think let's do that. So we're going to spend two gold and then take the Euron Greyjoy hero card into our hand. This means we go down to five gold, and let's take a look at this card. Obviously, as the hero, it has two crests for Greyjoy. Up in the top left, for a battle action, it lets you do the secret, drawing a random card from the top to add to the battle. Down below, if we're able to use this for its event, it says we can move a hero we control and any number of units in their domain to any other domain. If this results in a battle with another player, you steal one gold from them if possible. So they are very good at sailing, which thematically makes sense, and stealing gold also could be pretty nice for us. We, of course, have to place Euron Greyjoy into a domain we control. Currently, that is just Pike and Castle Black up here. Hmm... I think let's go to Castle Black. We really want to kick House Lannister back out of Winterfell to take our home domain back. For the other unit that we recruit, I think let's spend one more gold to bring this one out, and we'll put that into Castle Black as well. Well, we've all finished the event, so now the other die moves clockwise to House Baratheon. They could choose to sail or recruit, or set a die to its plot face, as well as have the option to set a die to the whisper face. It looks like they've decided to recruit and they want to do a Whisper action just for themselves before that happens. As before, the Whisper action lets you discard as many plot cards as you want, and then you draw from the deck to your plot hand size of four. They're going to discard the one card they had in their hand, and every card you discard when Whispering gives you one gold. Now they have no plot cards in their hand, so they will draw four. And after that, everyone, starting with the Baratheons, can recruit. They'll start by recruiting one of their own units. That will cost them one gold. 
and they're going to place it into Storm's End. And then the other unit they recruit will be Oberyn Martell. That will cost them two gold, and then they take that hero card into their hand. They had two gold, so they can spend it, bringing them to zero. And let's take a look at this event. That says that you can move a hero you control and no other units to any domain and start a battle. The hero counts as a four strength instead of two strength for this battle. So you can use this event to have a very strong solo hero battle. Again, that goes into their hand. And then they're going to place Oberyn here into the Reach. This is a House Martell unit, but since they're currently allied, this can go into any domain that the Baratheons control, including the Reach. Remember, the domain unit limit is up to three units per house. So that means they could put two more Martell and one more Baratheon unit into the Reach before they hit that limit. They are done recruiting, so now we can go. And I have to admit, I think... We need to draw our eyes down to the south. Lannister came up here and got in our way, and I do think we need to take back Winterfell. But after that, I think it's possible that we might need to avoid the Lannisters and try to start hitting the Baratheons. Otherwise, they might get too strong of a foothold with their multiple alliances. Either way, we are recruiting right now, and we do have four gold. And I think let's spend two of our gold to recruit this figure and put them up at Castle Black. We are now at the Stark unit limit. And then we can spend one gold to recruit this Greyjoy unit once again into Castle Black. There could still be one more Greyjoy unit over there. This is a very strong force. We, of course, have to spend that gold, and we are done recruiting, which means finally the Lannisters can recruit. They only have one gold, so they can't afford to recruit even one of their own figures, but they are going to spend this gold anyway in order to recruit a House Aaron unit. Now, they are tempted to put this unit into Winterfell. They can see we are building up a big force, and I think they can tell where this is going to be going. But just like what I mentioned, I think they can see that House Baratheon is getting very strong down here in the south, and I think they're more worried about that. They would love to keep Winterfell, but they figure if we fight back and forth up here in the north, then Baratheon might get too strong of a foothold. So they're going to place this unit instead down at Casterly Rock. They can't add it into the Erie because that already has three House Aaron units. This can easily fit into Casterly Rock, though. All right, everyone's had a chance to recruit, and now we get to choose either sailing or performing an event. We can, of course, set a die to the recruiting face, and we also have the ability to set a die to the sailing face. Part of me wants to play an event and use Euron Greyjoy, but the problem is one of the nice benefits of this is you can steal a gold from the person you attack, and both of our opponents are currently broke. I think we will do an event. I think the King's Road card in our hand could be pretty nice. And let's perform a march for our bonus action that only we get to do. Well, we've been building up to taking back Winterfell, and let's go for it. I think let's move with all three of these. And remember, when you march, you can move across two adjacent domains. So we'll go from Castle Black to Shadow Tower over to Winterfell. We could have dropped one or more of our figures off in Shadow Tower, but I really want to make sure we take back Winterfell, so I don't think we should dilute our force any. We currently have one hero and three figures, so that is five strength. The Lannisters have two power tokens and a castle for three strength. Now we can play cards, and we don't really have strong cards in our hand as far as numbers are concerned, but let's play Euron Greyjoy because that could be anything, really. We're going to draw that from the top of the deck. We put that here, and of course we don't have to put a card down, but if we don't put a card down, we are definitely telegraphing to our opponents that maybe we are not actually that powerful. So the Lannisters may place a card, and they will. We can reveal these, and... Oh, they retreated. So we don't even need to draw a top card from the deck. They retreated, which means the battle is over. And unfortunately for us, we're not considered to be a winner. That means we are not going to gain one victory point for this battle. And the result of this is that the Lannisters get to move all of their units out of that domain without losing any from the battle. I'm not too unhappy about this. We do still get Winterfell back, and they'll now retreat into Flint's Finger. Of course, we now take the Winterfell Castle back which means we once again have three. And now it's time for us to all perform an event starting with us. As I mentioned before, I think the King's Roads is going to be pretty good for us right now. We've got a decent number of units on the map, and we can spread out with this effect. Once again, that says we can perform up to two separate marches, and we gain three gold if neither of these results in a battle. I do want gold, so I think what we should do is move that there, marching into Shadow Tower, and just stop there. And then let's also march this unit over into Hornwood. 
It's possible that somebody could come over here and try to kick us out. They are relatively weak, but I think our opponents might have other things to focus on, and by spreading out like this into the fiefs, we can hopefully get some more gold from taxation later on this round. So that's finished our up to two marches. We did not start a battle, which means we get three gold, bringing us up to four. After that, the Lannisters can do an event. They only have one card in their hand. We haven't actually rolled any Whisper icons on the dice, and because of that, they are definitely running out of cards. Unfortunately for them, they're just not in a good spot to use this card. We can all know what it is. It is their hero card, because they haven't played it. This is Jamie Lannister. As you can see, the effect is pretty strong. It lets them perform a march or a sail action with a hero that they control and any number of units in their domain to start a battle. And if they battle in a castle domain or King's Landing, then they gain an extra strength in battle. So Jamie Lannister effectively negates one strength from fortifications when used with this event. Of course, it doesn't have to be Jamie Lannister in particular, just any hero that House Lannister controls. The problem is, if they play this, they have no other cards in their hand for that battle to add into the battle, and they are not convinced they would be able to have more than Baratheon, who they would probably attack, who has a big hand of cards. We only have one card, so they could go against us, I suppose. But even there, our one card could be enough to make this not happen. So they're just going to hold on to this and unfortunately not perform this event action at all. Finally, House Baratheon can perform an event. And they have decided to play Trial by Combat. It says that House Baratheon can move a single one of their units to any domain with a single enemy unit to start a battle. And House Baratheon gains one victory point in addition to all other normal scoring. With this in mind, they're going to move this House Martell unit all the way over here, and they've decided to go to Hornwood. They, of course, have to go to a domain with only one unit, and they could have gone to Castle Black, but if they had won that battle, they would get their fifth castle, and they're starting to worry that they might have too many castles. They really restrict the amount of maximum gold they can have, and they've decided they should probably not go after that right now. So they enter Hornwood, and this starts a battle with us. It's one strength to one strength currently. They can put one card down. And they do, and now we have one card. So we could play this or not. It's a retreat, though. Huh. I suppose I don't hate that. If we retreat out of here, we don't lose the unit. They stay on the board, which is nice. And we stop the Baratheons from getting an extra victory point. Yeah, we're going to do it. So we reveal the cards. Obviously, it is one to... Whoa, they put a four in there. <laughs> That's the red wedding card. So that means they had five, but we retreated. I figure we'll retreat to Last Hearth. And there was no winner, so no one gets a point for that, but this Trial by Combat card did give House Baratheon their first victory point. Well, we've all performed that event, and everyone has been the active player once, so now we can all perform this event, that is March, and it starts with the Lannisters and ends with us. They've decided to start at the Eyrie with two of these units, and they're going to head to the Three Sisters and drop a unit off, and then go to White Harbor. That is going to bring in two more fiefs for them, which is two more money through taxation, and that is their focus because they felt like they needed more gold this round than they had. That does mean they're spreading out pretty thin, but having more gold in the next round means hopefully they can recruit and bolster these positions in order to make use of them. Or they could reinforce somewhere else and make a bigger attack on enemies, hoping that they are too preoccupied to come up here and deal with these barely defended domains. The Lannisters are done marching, so now House Baratheon can and they've decided to move out of the Reach. They're going to bring one of the Baratheon units and the House Martell hero, and they're going to head into King's Landing. Remember, you can only do this if you have at least three castles, and House Baratheon has four, so they easily meet that criteria. Of course, if other units were in here, there would be a battle, but other units can't even enter this to battle House Baratheon until that house has at least three castles. We have three castles, so we could do that, but we're not really in a position to push towards King's Landing right now. So they are taking over King's Landing. They gain the Iron Throne. That, of course, gives them two extra defense in King's Landing. And it is, again, a wild ally token. So they effectively have three Tyrrell and three Martell when it comes to checking alliances. And that is just scary. <laughs> I think we need to do something about this in the future. Hopefully House Lannister can work alongside us to knock House Baratheon back down. Well, they are done marching, so now we can march. But I'm not sure if I want to. We could spread out our forces even more to get some more gold. But we only have space for two more gold, and we're easily making that back so I don't think we are going to use that march action. This means we are done with actions for the second round, and now we can check alliances. 
it doesn't look like anything actually changed. We are still in the majority with the Greyjoy tokens, and we have at least two. The same goes for House Lannister with the Aerons, and unfortunately, House Baratheon with these three Tyrrell and three Martell because of the Iron Throne. Lannister does have one Tyrrell ally token, but that is definitely not enough to contest this. We did not do a whole lot of plotting, besides, of course, the Baratheons in this second round. So, no alliances come or go, and we then have to cull the ally tokens down to two each per house, and it looks like we don't have to remove any. Once again, if, for example, we had three Greyjoy ally tokens, we would have to remove this one, going down to two. All right, now we can tax. We control two fiefdoms currently, so that is going to be two gold that we get bringing us up to six. The Lannisters are in three fiefs right now, so that is three gold for them. This brings them to three. The Baratheons are in one fief, that's Hornwood, for one gold, but they also get two gold for controlling King's Landing. So that is three gold. Now we can gain the benefits from our force track. We can't get any more gold, so that is capped out, and we don't get either of these, but we do draw two plot cards. So let's see what we found. Deal making. That says, for an event, we can take one power token from up to two different houses' token pools, paying one gold for each, and then we add them to our ally pool. That could definitely be powerful. And instruction in swords. This says, when played for an event, we can gain one victory point if our house's hero card is still in our hand, or if our house's hero card has been played, we can return it to our hand and gain two gold. The Lannisters are going to gain two more gold, bringing them to five. And then they also draw two plot cards. And down here, the Baratheons gain two gold, going to their maximum of five, and they draw a single plot card. Then we can pull all of our hero cards back into our hand, as long, of course, as the hero is out on the map still. And we have now finished the second round of the game. So we would move into the third round, and the Hand of the King token would pass clockwise for House Baratheon to go. But I think at this point, I'm now going to stop playing through the game. I do want to show an example of scoring, though, before we move on. So let's pretend we've actually just finished the third round of the game. After taxation, we would move this token forward onto the Vengeance token. Now we give this token out after all scoring is done, and we would now count up everyone's castles. The player with the most castles would get three points, second most would get two, and third most would get one, at least for a three-player game. In this current situation, House Baratheon has four, we have three, and Lannisters have two, so Baratheon would get three points, we would get two, and Lannister would get one. Then we would score our objectives. We would get one point because we control Winterfell right now, and we get one point because we do indeed control two fiefdoms right now. The same thing would happen for House Lannister. They actually control three fiefdoms. So if these weren't here when they did their scoring, they would actually get three points. But right now they have not recruited enough, so they would get those two. And House Baratheon does control Storm's End, so they'd get one. They would not get this one here. They don't actually control two fiefs, and even if they did, they wouldn't get it because this token is blocking it. Of course, if they managed to have all of these tokens out in a scoring, they would right now get a point for controlling King's Landing, but that is far from the case. After that, everyone gets one point for their alliances, so Baratheon would get two, we would get one, and the Lannisters would get one. That would be it for scoring, and only now would we give this Vengeance token to the player who has the lowest score. If there were multiple players who had the lowest score, then the Vengeance token would be removed from the game. In this example, though, Lannisters have the lowest score, so they would gain this Vengeance token, and for the rest of the game, every time they started a battle, they would gain an extra victory point. After that scoring, we would then move on to the next round. As you can see, the scoring is the same after the third round, fifth round, and sixth round of the game. Once we've completed six rounds and we do that standard scoring, the player with the most victory points will be the winner. There is no extra final scoring in this game. Well, at this point, I've taught most of the rules to the competitive base game, but before I wrap up this tutorial, I'd like to briefly talk about the Ice and Fire expansion. The main thing the expansion brings in is a fully cooperative way to play the game where all of the players are fighting to defeat the Night King. The expansion also brings in two new houses with the Night's Watch and the Targaryens, and I'll talk about those at the very end of this overview. All right, let's focus in, and I'm now going to give you a brief overview about how this cooperative mode works, in particular how it is different from the competitive mode that I've been covering in this video. The first thing that we can see is there are two new map pieces. These are areas north of the wall, and speaking of that, the wall is a piece that you place right over there to fend off the forces of the Night King in the north. Now, the goal of the cooperative game is simply to defeat the Night King in battle. The problem is the Night King is terrifying and very strong. Now, over here, all of the players have a shared victory point token, and the Night King also has a victory point token. 
Players gain victory points in largely the same ways as they do in the competitive game, but the Night King mainly gets victory points from the White Walkers that are out on the board during every taxation step. So in every single turn, the Night King will gain these points based off of the placed White Walkers, and if the Night King's victory points are ahead of the Alliance's victory points, then we are not allowed to attack them, and every non-player house becomes terrified. Now, when we are ahead on this track, we collectively have an ally pool. As you can see, this is the Westeros Alliance card, and we also have a shared money supply. As we spend gold, it is collective gold that everyone uses, and you can also see the castles that we take over are placed on here as opposed to on our house mats. Every two castles that we have when we score will get us points, so that's great, and because they are here, they are not actually blocking any gold reserves. Now, once again, we have a shared pool of these power tokens, and we also share the alliances that we have with these. So every player is essentially allied with each one of these tokens. Since we don't have tokens in our own ally pools, when we do the check alliance step, we instead compare the number in the alliance ally pool to the number of these tokens in the fear pool. These essentially show how terrified these houses are of the Night King, and as the Night King attacks, they can remove these ally tokens and put them into the fear pool, and the other main way they become terrified is from the Invoke Fear step. Now we have replaced the action card from the competitive game with this cooperative one here. All of the actions are the same as the competitive game, but as you can see, there are these icons after each. Now after everyone does one of these actions, we invoke fear by simply drawing the top card from the deck and all of these houses gain fear by taking the tokens from the mats and putting them down here. And for every one of these shields that don't match with a non-player house in this game, a White Walker instead is added to the fear pool. White Walkers in the Fear Pool are a problem because when we check alliances, we remove pairs of White Walkers from the Fear Pool, and for each of those, we have to take one of our own ally tokens and put them over here. When alliances are checked, if there are more tokens here than over here, then we move this over, and it does not mean that that house is allied with the Night King. Instead, it means they are terrified of the Night King so much to the point where they won't work with us, and in fact, if we try to attack them to kind of gain these tokens back, they get an extra defense against us. Now at this point, I imagine you are wondering how the Night King actually moves, and that has to do with the Ranger's Report. We reveal one of these at the start of each round, and this shows various locations where White Walkers are added, as well as where we put these Ice Exploration Tokens, and it also tells us where the Night King attacks. For example here, the Night King attacks Pike, so that means we move this Night King figure directly to Pike, and the first time the Night King attacks south of the wall, we remove the wall, and we instead place the Ice Dragon figure right there. Once the wall is removed, we can move north of the wall. Before that, we are not allowed to go up there. Now, when the Night King attacks, if he has more victory points than we currently do, then we just instantly lose this battle. We have to lose one of these tokens, specifically a non-player token if possible, to the Fear Pool, and then we have to retreat away from that position, just like normal. In addition to that, each time the Night King attacks, we add more White Walkers down onto the board, and these White Walkers can initiate battle as soon as they are placed. When fighting White Walkers, they have a base strength of 1, and they always pull a secret to add to that, and they gain strength down here depending on the number of Valyrian Steel tokens we have found. As you can see, there are brown tokens down here and the blue tokens up there. Each time you move into a region with a force of three or more, you flip that token over, and if it is something like this, well, that lets you remove a White Walker. These could get you money, and you can also reveal ones that show Valyrian Steel. You place those right over here, and for each one placed, the White Walkers have one less strength when we fight them. Speaking of fighting back, let's now focus over here on the Night King's area. Now again, we cannot attack the Night King unless our victory points are ahead of the Night King's on the track, and when we do attack the Night King, they have a base strength of 3. They also always use the Conscript's ability, which gives them 1 strength for every adjacent White Walker in their regions and it pulls a secret card. In addition to that, the Night King gains all of these strength bonuses, which is obviously insurmountable at the start of the game. Fortunately, as we venture north of the wall, we can reveal some of these tokens, and some of them are Dragon Glass. Now, these can go on here and significantly lower the amount of strength the Night King has. The problem is, in order to get this Dragon Glass, we have to defeat the Ice Dragon that flies over onto that spot to protect the Dragon Glass. The dragon is strong, and only if we defeat it will it go back to the wall position. We'll take this and put it on there, making it much more likely that we can defeat the Night King in battle. Now that is the only way we win the game. 
Just like in the base game, there are six rounds, but we only score twice after the third and fifth round because at the end of the sixth round, if we have not defeated the Night King in battle, we just lose the game. So there's no reason to do that third scoring. The last thing I want to mention about the cooperative mode is at the start of each round, we each get one die, plus the starting player gets two, and the last player gets any extras depending on the player count. Then we all roll these dice, and these are the ones that we're going to have. Essentially, there is no dice draft, we just get the dice, roll them, and then of course the player with the two dice is the active player moving down, and the last player, if they roll extra dice for the player count, they choose the dice to place on here, showing an action that everyone will be able to perform. So, as you can see, you must all play together, really figuring out how you can get a foothold in order to fight the Night King. And I do want to be clear that we are allies with everyone that is in the Alliance. So that means we can move all of these non-player houses as long as they are allied with us, but we cannot move units from other player houses. We are also not allowed to fight each other or end a move in the same domain as a player house. So, you should now have a broad idea for how this cooperative mode works. Obviously, I've not gone into any of these specific details. I just wanted to give you a brief overview so that you could see if this is something you want to learn more about. The last thing to talk about are the two new houses that come in the expansion. We have the Knight's Watch that begins at Castle Black and House Targaryen that begins at Dragonstone. The dice ability for the Knight's Watch says that you can set a die to any face that has not been used yet in that round, and for House Targaryen, it says at the end of the taxation step, you can hatch one egg into a dragon. Dragons are only used when House Targaryen is in the game, and as you can see, their hero event says they can pay three gold to place a dragon egg into a domain they control. You may place multiple eggs as long as you can pay for them. Now again, these dragon eggs go into domains, and after taxation, any that are still on the board will hatch into dragons, and these dragons act just like heroes for the purposes of the strength they have, but they can also fly when a march or a sailing action is used, and that lets them move three domains, and they can fly over any opposing units. Well, that's going to bring my brief overview for the Ice and Fire expansion to a close, and I hope you enjoyed learning how to play Tiny Epic Game of Thrones. As always, I'd like to thank everyone who's been supporting this channel, including these producer-level Patreon supporters. If you too would like to directly support the channel in the creation of future videos like this one, then please go to jongetsgames.com support. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please click the like button for it down below, as well as the subscribe button for the channel. Thanks for watching.